so today I will focus on our recent work that actually we started even when I was still working here at IGGB. And I'll just give you a brief introduction about our research field. But so if you have any questions during the talk, please you know, stop me and ask so we can you know, try to make it as productive as possible. So, so well, uh, first of all, my lab, since I was also here in Trieste, has been historically interested in DNA repair and in the mechanism of replication stress response. So you might know that there are several molecules available to inhibit DNA replication. And these molecules basically arrest DNA replication by several different means. So there are compounds like, for example, cisplatin, which are cross-linking agents that basically create a damage on the DNA template and arrest DNA replication by creating a damage on the template, or camptotisin, which is a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor that also basically creates a damage on the template. Then there are other molecules that act in a totally different fashion. So for example, there is hydroxyurea that is basically depriving cells from NTP pools, which are needed for enzymatic activity, or compounds like acetylcholine that in directly inhibit enzymes involved in replication, such as, for example, a polymerase. So it's perhaps not surprising also to, to notice that many of these compounds are actively used for as chemotherapeutic drugs. And the rationale, if you want, be behind the use of these compounds for cancer treatment is rather simple and logical because, of course, by targeting DNA replication, they are also likely to target actively proliferating cancer cells. However, for many of them, how they inhibit DNA replication is not really well understood, or even better, uh, how basically the replication machinery responds to an insult induced by these compounds is really still an open question. And so the mechanism that I will describe today is called replication fork reversal. And I've included these two movies just to give you sort of an overview of how it works. And this is really like sort of a novel uh, mechanism that is now emerging as a pivotal mechanism of replication stress response. And the idea is basically that if you have a lesion ahead of a replication fork, like in this case, the replication machinery has a strategy to sense the problem ahead of the fork. And instead of moving forward and collide with that, with that lesion, it undergoes this process which is called replication fork reversal. Now this process does not require any new DNA synthesis because you simply have the peeling off of the leading and the lagging strand of the replication fork, which are complementary, so they can just pair together and associate to form this structure, which is also called a chicken food structure. So basically, this mechanism is a mechanism that says, OK, if there is a lesion ahead of the fork, the replication, instead of moving forward, goes back. And so if you imagine you have the leading and the lagging strand that can basically detach from the complementary duplex and pair together like this to form a, a chicken food structure. There is no DNA synthesis, new DNA synthesis involved. It's simply, again, the pairing of two complementary strands. And so this basically would give time for the lesion ahead of the fork to be repaired so that then only when the lesion is repaired, replication can resume normally. And the idea is that if this mechanism doesn't work, then we will have an, uh, what would happen is that the replication fork instead would simply move forward, eventually collide with the lesion, leading to a double strand break, which is, of course, toxic for the cell. And so the idea that replication forks can reverse was proposed by the group of Strauss more than 35 years ago. And he was studying basically the effect of UV light on mammalian cells. And he suggested that this is maybe what was happening. But there was never a direct evidence that these kind of structures could actually form in vivo in cells. Until basically last year, the group of Massimo Lopez in Zurich showed that re re reverse replication forks can form in cells. And the main technique that he used to show reverse fork formations is electron microscopy. So this is an electron micrograph of a, a, and an example of a reverse replication fork. So this is the DNA. These are the two arms of the replication fork. And this is the reverse arm of the fork. And he was able to detect a high fraction of these molecules by treating cells with a DNA topoisomerase 1 inhibitor, which is called camptotisin, the prototype, which is the prototype of a series of drugs which again are used for cancer treatment. So the idea is that if we treat cells with these uh, topoisomerase 1 inhibitors, 
Again, the replication, instead of moving forward, again goes back, forms these reverse fork structures, and this is true not only in human cells, but also in, in Xenopus and in yeast. So it's something that is conserved, basically, in different organisms. And the other observation that was made by Massimo's group it was that the formation of these reverse forks is somehow dependent on the activity of an enzyme which is called PARP. So uh, just a brief introduction because um, some of you might not know what PARP is. So PARP is a protein that is involved in DNA repair and is known to uh, poly-EDP ribosylate its protein targets. And so basically uh, what Massimo saw is that by inhibiting PARP activity, with a compound which is called olaparib, which by the way is also used for cancer treatment, the fraction of reverse forks decreases from 33% to 4.3%. And then basically he validated this also using knockout cell lines. And so this is a PARP1 knockout cell line and you see there is also a decrease from 26 to 10%. Now you might appreciate that the decrease is not as great as when using the PARP inhibitor. But this is because there are several PARP variants in cells. So if you knock out PARP1, there is still PARP2, PARP3 that can function. So basically, he then added the PARP inhibitor to the PARP1 knockout cells. And again, he could recapitulate the same effect that he saw in mammalian cells. So basically, the take home of message of this paper was that, again, there is formation of reverse forks, that this is an important transaction that takes place in, in response to uh, DNA topesomerase 1 inhibition, and that the formation of these reverse forks is dependent on PARP activity. However, there were some key questions that were really left open from Massimo's work. And the first question is, first of all, why would PARP activity be required to promote the formation of these reverse forks? And to understand why this question is important, I might need to give you just a brief introduction about uh, DNA topisomerases, I don't know how familiar you are. So DNA topisomerases are enzymes that release positive or negative supercoil on DNA. And so uh, type 1 topisomerases do so by creating a single-stranded nick on the DNA, okay? So the idea is that if you create a single-stranded nick, the positive supercoil or the superhelical tension can be released. And that's very important for the progression of DNA replication. So the topoisomerases are also important then for sealing this nick once the superhelical tension has been released. So these compounds basically are DNA intercalators that block the religation activity of the topoisomerase so that then whenever the nick has been formed, they intercalate on the DNA, the, the topoisomerase will remain covalently bound to DNA and the positive superhelical tension cannot be released. And so there was a paper that was uh, published a few years ago, well, now six years ago, by the group of Decker in Holland, showing that if we treat, cell, well, this was a single molecule work, so really it was a, an in vitro study, but it was showing that if we treat DNA with camptotisin or topisomerase 1 inhibitors, then we basically block the release of the positive supercoil ahead of the replication fork. And because of that, he was suggesting that this would spontaneously push the reverse fork back leading to the formation of a, for, a, a, a reverse fork, okay? So if this is true, why would PARP activity be required to drive this process? Of course, was still an open question, okay? And again, if you have doubts or it's not clear, please ask. I mean, so, uh, so I, mean, I don't care to show you all the slides, but it's good if you at least, you know, can get the main message of, 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 of the work we are doing. So the other question, of course, was, if we have the formation of these reverse forks, how are they eventually restarted? So is there an enzyme which is, important, which is present in cells to push these reverse forks back to normal? Because of course you, I mean, the idea is that you have formation of reverse forks to put replication fork like in a park position, waiting for the lesion to be repaired. But once the lesion is repaired, replication has to restart. So you need something to push this reverse fork back to normal. And so, these are the two questions that basically we addressed in our lab. And before I actually show you the actual data, I have one last, in, last slide of introduction that was actually, uh, that is probably familiar with people that knew me since I was here at IGGB, that is on recu cases, because these were the enzymes that we were studying already while I was working here in Trieste. So recu cases. Uh, are enzymes involved in the maintenance of genome stability. 
and they are very well conserved among different organisms. So bacteria, yeast have only one of them. However, vertebrates in general in human cells have more than one RECU enzyme. So human cells have five of them, which are called RECU1, RECU5, RECU4, BLM, and Werner. And there are also disorders associated with mutations in uh, uh, some of the RECU helicase genes. And I won't go into the details because that's not really the purpose of this talk. I will simply say that these disorders are associated with uh, very different clinical features. So for example, Werner patients are associated with premature, premature aging features. So suggesting that these helicases, even though they are all involved in the maintenance of genome stability, they are also likely to play distinct functions in cells. And with the idea of understanding what might be the distinct functions of all these proteins, when my lab was still based in, is in, uh, here in Trieste, actually uh, Federico, who is, who is here in the audience, uh, started a project aimed at, inter at defining interactors of all five human RECU enzymes. And basically, in collaboration with the group of Ebersold, Federico went to Zurich and established five inducible cell lines that expressed a double-tagged version of each one of the five human RECU enzymes. And then we could check, of course, the expression of these proteins by immunofluorescence. And basically, we could also use tetracycline to express the exogenous protein and do a titration so that the amount of exogenous protein is equivalent to the amount of the endogenous one. And so then basically, we went through two steps of purification uh, and then mass spec analysis. And we basically identified interactors for all five human RECU enzymes. But for the purpose of today's talk, I will focus on the interactors that we found for RECU1. And uh, I should also mention, since I see him there, also Gianluca was very helpful in the establishment of these cell lines. So in the case of RECU1, one of the main interactors that we found is actually PARP. And I won't show you the others, because again, this is what is important for the purpose of this talk. So these were three replicate experiments that were made. And these were the number of peptides that we found uh, for PARP in the three experiments. So then basically, we went on to confirm if the two proteins interact. And we validated this uh, by standard immunoprecipitation approaches. And yes, we confirmed that there was an interaction between the two proteins using either RECU1 antibodies or PARP antibodies. And then we asked, OK, since I told you before, PARP is an enzyme that poly-EDP ribosylate its targets, we were wondering whether actually PARP activity was somehow mediating this interaction. And so we used another PARP inhibitor, which is called NU1025, to check whether the interaction is somehow regulated by PARP activity. And the answer is yes. So this is the interaction in the absence of the PARP inhibitor. And if we add the PARP inhibitor, you see there is a decreased interaction between the two proteins. Then we added DNA damaging agents. And what we saw is that if we use camptotisin, for instance, the interaction seems to be slightly increased. But again, it is decreased in the presence of the PARP inhibitor. And then basically, we validated this using a series of other drugs, such as mitomycin C, hydrogen peroxide, MMS. And the results were always consistent. So there is an interaction which is increased by DNA damage, but is again regulated by PARP activity. And then basically, at the time, again, this was done while I was in Trieste. Uh, there was Matteo, a PhD student, that joined the lab and then moved with, relocated with me to St. Louis. And so when, while he was still in Trieste, he was working on mapping, basically, the interaction domains of RECU1 with PARP. And uh, first of all, he demonstrated using the recombinant proteins that the two proteins directly interact. And that was done by Far Western and GST pull down experiments. And then he also defined the domain of RECU1, which is involved in the interaction, which is the C terminus of RECU1. And this is not surprising because the C terminus is the region that is less conserved among RECU proteins. So it's known to be involved in mediating protein protein interactions. And then basically, he did the opposite exercise from the side of PARP and identified the regions of PARP which are involved in the interaction and discovered, basically, that there are two domains of PARP involved in RECU1 recognition. One is the N-terminus of, of PARP, and the other is the central automodification auto domain of PARP itself. And since I told you that PARP, again, can poly-ADP ribosylate its targets and has this poly-ADP ribose also attached to itself, we, we checked whether RECU1 not only interacts with PARP, but also interacts with PAR, so with the poly-ADP ribose. 
And the answer is yes. So this is a dot blot experiment that instead was done after relocating the lab, always by Matteo, and showing basically that the same domain of FreQ1 that binds PARP also binds the poly ADP ribose, so the C-terminus of FreQ1. And again, uh, we also validated the fact that this domain not only binds PARP and PAR, but is also subject of the poly ADP ribosylation activity of PARP. So it's also poly ADP ribosylated by PARP. So at that point, uh, basically we were aware of the work of Massimo Lopez, that he was showing again that there is formation of reverse force structures, which is dependent on PARP activity. And we knew that RECQ1 interacts with PARP. So we wondered whether RECQ1 might be involved in this process. And so this is when also Shiva joined the lab. And so we decided to test this idea, first of all in vitro, and then into a cellular context. And this is what I'm going to show you now in the next few slides. So to test this idea in vitro, we basically used a radioactively labeled DNA substrates. And so we generated basically two substrates. Uh, we used four oligos that could be annealed in two different ways, either to create a reverse fork, which, uh, as I told you before, is also called a chicken foot structure, okay, or a functional replication fork. Then we basically added RecQ1 to the reaction, and we tested whether RecQ1 could promote restart of reverse forks in vitro, or the opposite reaction of fork reversal. This is basically uh, the result, and you see when we start from the chicken foot structure, we can convert that in the presence of RecQ1 to a functional replication fork, but RecQ1 is unable to promote the opposite reaction of fork regression. So this in vitro experiment suggested that again, RecQ1 could promote very efficiently fork restoration, but not fork regression. And then uh, we did a control experiment because you might notice that this substrate has a gap here of single strand and in the leading strand. So we basically just confirmed that if we included also a double-stranded region here, the results were exactly the same. And another sort of control that we did was to show that this activity depends, of course, on the ATPase activity of RecQ1. So if we use lowly hydrolyzable analog of ATP, like ATP gamma S or EMP, APNP, there is no fork restoration. Or if, you, if we use ATPA's deficient mutants of RecQ1, again, there is no fork restoration. So the message was, okay, RecQ1 might be important to restart the reverse forks in vitro. So then we knew that RecQ1 interacts with PARP. So we added PARP to the reaction mix. And so we used equimolar concentrations of RecQ1 and activated PARP and tested if activated PARP has an effect on the fork restoration activity of RecQ1. And the results showed that equimolar concentrations of activated PARP inhibit the fork restoration activity of RecQ1. And we knew that this was not due to a competition between the two proteins for DNA binding because parylated PARP does not bind DNA very well. Okay? And this was already known and published in the literature, and this is because the poly ADP ribose is negatively charged, and so by electrostatic repulsion would not recognize DNA very well. Okay? And in fact, we validated basically the same result instead of using PAR, simply using the poly ADP ribose, so PAR, and again, the results are the same in the presence of poly ADP ribose, the fork restart activity of RecQ1 is reduced. So then, of course, uh, we asked whether this activity was specific for RecQ1 or other RecQ helicases might share a similar activity. And again, we tested this initially in vitro, and we tested this for various RecQ helicases, although I'm showing you just the results for Werner, which is one of the five of them. And uh, what we saw is that Werner behaves differently from RecQ1, because instead of being specifically able to promote just reverse fork restart, is able to efficiently promote both fork restart or restoration and fork regression. And there was a report by the group of Will Bohr at NIH showing that Werner is also interacting with PARP. So we tested whether maybe this activity was somehow affected by PARP, as we have seen in the case of RecQ1. And the answer is no. So what we saw is that, uh, well, in this case, I should mention, probably just for, to be more precise, that Werner is the only Recuhili case that has both an exonuclease activity and a helicase activity. So to study the helicase activity of Werner, we need to have an exonuclease dead mutant of Werner, and this is what we have used, actually. But what we have seen here is that 
uh, basically the fork restoration activity of PARP, of Werner, is not affected by parilated PARP. So at that point, basically, we thought, OK, maybe RecQ1 is the protein involved in the restart of these reverse forks that were initially detected by Massimo in the paper I mentioned. And an indication that this might be the case actually originated also from studies that were started before I left and then continued by, well, were started actually by Ramiro and then continued by Sasha Koenig, who is also here in the audience, where we were studying basically what uh, the DNA damage sensitivity of RecQ1 depleted cells. And what we have seen is that RecQ1 depleted cells are exquisitely sensitive to treatment with uh, DNA topoisomerase inhibitors. In fact, they are sensitive to treatment with camptotisin and also a toposide, which is a uh, type 2 topoisomerase inhibitor. And another indication that we might have been in the right pathway came from another experiment that instead was done uh, more recently by Matteo in the lab, showing that both RecQ1 and PARP not only interact, but also interact at the level of replication forks. So the technique used by uh, Matteo is called IPOND, where IPOND stays for isolation of proteins on NITS and DNA, and is a protocol that was developed last year by the group of Dave Cortez at Vanderbilt. And I just included this cartoon because uh, some of you might not be familiar with this protocol. So basically, this protocol uses the ability of replicating DNA to incorporate a marker. And in this case, the marker that is used is EDU, where EDU stays for 5 prime 18 yield uh, to deoxyuridine. And so basically, we, we, we cross cells in the presence of EDU, and then we cross-link proteins to EDU-labeled replication forks. Then we conjugate biotin through a copper chemistry to the EDU-labeled replication forks. We share the DNA, and we purified, basically, these fragments using streptavidin. And then we just use a simple Western analysis to see what are the proteins associated with these fragments. And now this technique has been broadly used by several labs, so there are huge projects also uh, to identify novel replication factors or repl factors associated with replication stress response. So basically using this approach, we were able to show that both PARP1 and RECQ1 bind to replication forks and that the amount of the two proteins seems to be slightly increased when we use camptotisin doses which are sufficient to induce fork reversal. So from these studies, we sort of proposed a model where we thought maybe we identified the factor which is important to the restart these reverse forks. And we thought this factor might be indeed RecQ1. And we sort of had an idea of what might be the role of PARP activity in this context, which is in fact not to drive the formation of the reverse forks, but simply to inhibit RecQ1 and prevent RecQ1 from restarting reverse fork prem prematurely before the lesion is repaired. But of course, we, at that point, we could not publish this story without having some cellular evidence that all I told you is actually true also in a cellular context. And so now, the next few experiments that I'm going to show you are uh, basically experiments that are done uh, mainly by Saravana, who went to the laboratory of Raymond Nath in Seattle to learn this DNA fiber technology to, mo to monitor, basically, DNA replication dynamics genome-wide. And again, I will just spend maybe one minute to explain you this technique. Otherwise, you won't be able to understand the results. And maybe you're not so familiar with this approach. It's basically just an immunofluorescence approach that uh, follows DNA replication. So what we do in this case is to incubate cell, uh, cells with a marker that is incorporated on replicating DNA. And we use first a red marker, CLDU, and then we switch to a marker of a different color, IDU. Then we take cells, we lyse them, and then we use a technique similar to combing to stretch all the DNA into many fibers. It's basically just a matrix which is silanized, and you put that on top of your cellular extract, and DNA will enter these capillaries and be stretched into many fibers. And so in this way, you can basically study and visualize all the replication events, more than 700 normally we count, that are taking place in cells. And you can compare, for example, a wild-type situation versus a scenario that is missing your protein of interest. And the idea is if there is a problem with replication, these tracks would be shorter because replication will be slower, right? So this is the simple approach that you can use. So in our context, what, what we did was to treat cells with CLDU, then add camptotisin, which is this DNA damaging agent that I told you before induces fork reversal, 
okay? And then we added IDU. So the idea is, if there is formation of reverse forks, because of that, the green tracks should become shorter, right? Because the green tracks are forming after the addition of camptotisin, okay? And this is the quantification of the results, and I will walk you to this graph because of, I know it's kind of complicated. So this is the average length of the tracks that we measure. And again, we score over 700 tracks for each experiment. So in the absence of DNA damage, the green tracks are on average approximately, let's say, 20 micrometers long. Then if we treat cells with camptotisin, the length of these tracks decreases. And that makes sense because, again, it's consistent with the idea that if we treat cells with camptotisin, we have formation of reverse forks, so replication forks slowing. Okay? So then, if we use camptotisin and the PARP inhibitor, Olaparib, we see that PARP inhibition basically prevents forks slowing. And this is, again, consistent with what was published by Massimo because Massimo was saying PARP activity is important for fork reversal. If you inhibit PARP, you don't have formation of reverse forks. And indeed, we see that if we need it PARP, we don't have fork slowing, which is probably meaning that we don't have formation of reverse forks, okay? And then we did the same experiment, silencing RECQ1, either by sRNA or by lentiviral mediated technologies. The results were basically the same. And again, what we saw in this case is that the results were exactly the same, except when we used the PARP inhibitor and camptotisin. Because in this case, we saw that even if PARP is inhibited, then the forks remain slow. What it means in this case is that even if PARP is inhibited, the reverse forks cannot restart because indeed cells are missing the enzyme which is important to restart them, which is in fact RECQ1, okay? I mean, what suggests that at this point, okay? So then we validated that this effect was specifically due to RECQ1 depletion, and we did uh, some genetic complementation experiments where we basically depleted RECQ1 and rescued the phenotype using an SHRNA resistant version of RECQ1, and that is what is happening. And we also used an ATPase deficient mutant to show that this fork regression or restart activity of RECQ1 is dependent on its ATPase activity. Because if we use this mutant, then we see that this mutant cannot rescue the phenotype, the fork progression phenotype observed in RECQ1 depleted cells. And so then we wanted to validate also our biochemical finding that this is a specific activity of RECQ1, which is not shared by other human RECQ helicases. So we basically did that by silencing all other human RECQ helicases. And again, for a purpose of simplicity, I'm showing here just the results that we got for two of them, because otherwise this graph will be really too long. But basically, here what you see is that I, if we silence Werner or BLM, and treat cells with tolaparib and camptotisin, then the uh, inhibition of PARP is able to rescue fork slowing. What it means basically in this case, that when PARP is inhibited, there is still a factor which is important to restart these reverse forks, which is in fact RECQ1, okay? And again, if you have doubts, I know this part might be a bit difficult, so please stop me and I will uh, go through again. But basically, we validated then all these findings by electron microscopy. And this is sort of the, uh, basically one of the last slides of this part of my talk. So by electron microscopy, we scored the fraction of reverse forks that form under the different genetic backgrounds, okay? And so here the idea is that if we treat cells with camptotisin, there is accumulation of reverse forks. And again, this is an example of a reverse fork. Again, these are the two daughter strands, and this is the reverse arm of the fork, okay? So more than 30% of the forks undergo fork reversal. You might say, why 30, not 100? Because, of course, these are asynchronous cells, so not all the forks are scored at the same time, okay? So you have 30% of the forks that undergo fork reversal upon CPT treatment. Then we use the PARP inhibitor, and we confirm what Massimo found. If we inhibit PARP activity, the fraction of reverse forks goes down from 30% down to 8%. So again, PARP activity is important for the formation of these reverse forks. Then what we did was to, again, silence RECQ1. And what we saw is that if we silence RECQ1, even though PARP is inhibited, the fraction of reverse forks remain high, meaning that in this case, even though PARP is inhibited, 
cells are not able to restart this reverse force because they lack the enzyme which is important to restart them, which is in fact the Q1, okay? And this restart experiment that we did was basically an experiment that we did treating cells with camptotisin, then uh, removing camptotisin, waiting, waiting three hours after camptotisin removal before scoring the fraction of reverse forks, and the results are again the same because you see even after three hours from camptotisin removal, the reverse forks cannot restart. They are still there if RecQ1 is absent, okay? And so basically, uh, again, this is the, the mechanism that we suggest for how reverse forks are regulated in response to camptotisin treatment where again we think that we identify the factor which is important to restart them, which is the Q1, and we provided an explanation of what the role of PARP activity is, that again is not to drive the formation of these reverse forks, but is to basically inhibit the Q1 and control the Q1 from restarting forks before this lesion is repaired. This model would also predict that, let's say we inhibit PARP, then the Q1 would act in an untimely fashion. So it should restart forks even before the lesion is repaired, okay? And indeed, if that's the case, then what would happen is that in the com using a combination of PARP inhibitors and camptotisin, we should have accumulation of double-stranded breaks, right? Because RecQ1 is restarting the forks, again, before this lesion is repaired. However, if we inhibit PARP in a RecQ1 deficient background, then reverse forks should not be able to restart so then we shouldn't have accumulation of double-stranded breaks. And of course, we validated this by scoring the fraction of double-stranded breaks that form under the different genetic backgrounds. And we used two techniques, and I will show you this in the next two slides. One is pulse field gel electrophoresis, and one is a basically immunofluorescence approach, just to score double-strand breaks. So pulse field gel electrophoresis is one method you can use to score double-strand breaks. Here is our positive control ionizing radiation that induces double strand breaks. And I mean, you can just focus on the quantification here, showing that again, if we treat cells with camptotisin and inhibit PARP, we have accumulation of double strand breaks because RecQ1 is restarting these forks untimely. But if we deplete RecQ1, the fraction of double strand breaks goes down. And then we validated this by immunofluorescence by looking at the co-localization between 53BP1 and gamma H2X, which is basically a way of detecting double strand breaks in cells. And here is the degree of co-localization shown by the gray bar. So if we treat cells with camptotisin and olaparib, we have accumulation of double strand breaks. But again, if we silence RecQ1, the fraction of double strand breaks goes down. So this basically validate our hypothesis that if we inhibit PARP in the presence of RecQ1, we have accumulation of double strand breaks because RecQ1 is restarting the forks untimely. So why all this is important? Because I told you, for example, that camptotisin is the prototype of a series of, of compounds which, is used, which are used for cancer treatment. And similarly, PARP inhibitors are much used also for breast cancer treatment in particular. So now I think we have an explanation, for example, for why PARP inhibitors in combination with camptotisin are particularly effective for the treatment of a subset of uh, breast cancer patients that have mutations in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, because BRCA1 and BRCA2 are two proteins involved in double-stranded break repair. So here, you imagine that if you treat these patients with camptotisin and PARP inhibitors, you would have accumulation of double-stranded breaks. And these breaks cannot be repaired because these patients have mutations in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, right? So, and of course also, this sort of mechanism predicts that if we silence RecQ1, we might be able also to affect the, the sensitivity of cancer cells to DNA toposomerase 1 inhibitors. And this is what we are currently, currently testing also in animal models, and the results are very promising. And maybe another time I can show you more about that too. So this is sort of the take-home message of this, uh, well, of the work we recently published, and I won't go through the different points because I guess we already discussed them. And I will actually just spend maybe the last 10 minutes to show you what are the new directions that we are following now. So first of all, now we have evidence that this fork reversal uh, phenotype that we have seen in response to treatment with DNA topoisomerase 1 inhibitors is actually a more general transaction that takes place in cells when we use different kinds of genotoxic drugs. So for example, even mitomycin C and cisplatin, which is not shown in this slide, which are two drugs widely used for the treatment of ovarian cancer, 
accumulate reverse faults. The same is true with hydroxyurea. So the idea we are proposing is that fork reversal is really like a novel mechanism that the replication machinery uses to deal with replication stress. Whenever there is a problem, this mechanism basically gives time for the replication to reverse, wait for the problem to be solved, and then restart. And the other question that we are interested in addressing is if there are other mechanisms to restart these reverse forts in addition to the one I described today. And in reality, we are already in a good stage of defining an alternative mechanism. And I will just show you three slides on what we are doing. This work is actually almost about to be finished, but I just wanted to give you the idea uh, and of, uh, I mean, the, behind the, the, the work we are doing. So there were reports while we were doing these studies that nucleases might be involved in the processing of reverse forms. And it's logical in a way because nucleases are enzymes that chew up the DNA. So the idea is that if you have the formation of reverse forks, here you have something like a double-stranded end which is exposed and might be easily eaten by a nuclease, okay? So we wanted to test if this was true. And to test this, we basically used our DNA fiber approach, the same I've shown you before, where we labeled cells with CLDU, and, which is red, and then the IDU, which is green, and then treated uh, cells with the drug. So the idea is that in this way, first we have accumulation of reverse forks, then we treat the cells with the drug. If there is a nuclease that degrades the reverse fork, this green track should become shorter because the, green, the, the reverse arm should be degraded by the nuclease, right? And so this is what we've tested. And the answer is that this is happening, and it's happening particularly if you miss RECU1, which makes sense. Because if you miss RECU1, maybe there is another mechanism that becomes predominant to process these structures. So what we saw here is that if we treat cells with hydroxyurea, so this is the, uh, basically this graph shows you the average length of the green tracks. This is our control, look depleted cells. These are RECU1 depleted cells in the absence of DNA damage, so nothing happens. If we treat cells with hydroxyurea, you see that the average length slightly decreases compared to the control. But if we deplete RECQ1, we see a marked decrease in the average length of these replication tracks relative to the control, indicating that there is indeed maybe a nuclease that is degrading these reverse forks if RECQ1 has been depleted from cells. And then we sort of studied this in a kinetic fashion by basically seeing how this changes if we incubate cells for longer time period with different drugs. This is just one of the experiments we did, so incubating cells for longer times with hydroxyurea. And the idea is the longer, time, the longer you treat with hydroxyurea, the more degradation we see in the absence of RECU1. And that this is actually important because it tells you that the degradation starts from the newly formed DNA and goes inside because that's how the, way the, the Gaussian are moving. And then basically we did a systematic search of which might be the nuclease involved in this process. So we started knocking down all, well, most likely human nucleases. Again, I won't show you all the data, but we basically reached the conclusion that the nuclease involved in human is, is called human DNA2. Because if we deplete, if we co-deplete RECQ1 and human DNA2, these are the Western experiments showing the level of depletion, you see that this fork degradation phenotype goes away. So if then we tested other nucleases, this is not, this not happening. But again, this would be the purpose of maybe of a future talk, so I don't want to uh, um, I mean, show you too many data at the same time. But basically, the results are the same also if we use camptotisin or if we use mitomycin C. So basically, the model that we are now proposing for this uh, alternative mechanism is that which again might become important, is particularly in the absence of RECU1, is that if we have formation of reverse forks, maybe there is a nuclease that degrades these forks. And we know now this nuclease is DNA2. And we have data also showing that there is another factor that helps DNA2 in degrading these forks. And of course, there are two possibilities that we are currently investigating. One is that DNA2 is simply degrading both arms of the reverse forks. And so by doing that, we'll simply reestablish a functional replication fork. That's fine, but it's not ideal because, of course, we will have loss of genetic information because this arm will be degraded, right? 
The other possibility is that DNA2 preferentially uh, degrades one of the two strands, which, uh, um, which we think is what is happening, creating these sort of flap substrates, which then can be uh, basically uh, resolved by a homology-directed repair-like mechanism. And we have evidence that this is the case. Again, I'm not showing you the data, because we do see accumulation of RPA32 foci in this genetic background. And RPA32 is a protein that binds to single-stranded DNA. And so the fact that we do see that is actually suggesting that this is the mechanism that is taking place. So this is sort of a work that is still in progress. Hopefully, I mean, we'll be finished in a few months. And uh, I mean, and, but uh, I mean, we still have some, some questions to address. And uh, I didn't want to take uh, too long also to give you some time for questions, if you like. But of course, I, want, uh, I don't have to forget to acknowledge all the people that did the work, some of which are also here. So this is my lab in St. Louis. And of course, uh, uh, Saravan, I told you, was basically the, is the, basically the guy that established the DNA fiber approach in the lab. Matteo is now in Zurich, and he's coming back in, in January. He's establishing the electromicroscopy technique in the lab. Shiva is here, defended her thesis yesterday, and she did all the in vitro work with the substrates. And these are other students that uh, basically are joining the lab now and that are working on the DNA2 related project. And of course, my small group still at, in Trieste, Sasha and Valentina, and Sasha has been in, instrumental for all the survival assays. And my, uh, of course, good friends and previous colleagues, Federico that started all the proteomic work, Rami that started the cellular work, Poyana that is not here anymore, Francesca that is here in the audience, the colon of the old lab, Gianluca Triolo, that is also here in the audience, and my collaborators, Massimo, Ray, and Rudy. And finally, of course, the, the founding, which is, I mean, which are essential to do all this, especially if you work in the US, I mean, otherwise you are dead. But basically, it's the NIH in this case, the Cancer Center of St. Louis University, the President Founds of St. Louis University that helps me running my lab here, and for the Synchrotron at Trieste, the IRC that is still active for a year, and the Glioma project that is supporting Valentina and Vale. So thank you again for your attention. Thank you.